So it's nearly two o'clock. I just want to apologise to everyone that had trouble getting in first thing to the meeting. I don't think there's a problem with Eventbrite as such because most people did get in okay, but I know from having attended events myself and just tried to click on a link expecting to go straight to a meeting or to the Zoom link and it hasn't happened. I'm not quite sure why that is. Um, I think I've answered all my emails from people that have got back to us through Eventbrite saying they had problems, so apologies for anyone that missed the very start. As Cathy said, we will be, we are recording. Um, it's a good point actually, if you missed the very start, we are recording the, the, the talks um, so that we can um, we can show them, stream them at a different, a later date. Um, so if you don't want your face to be filmed, if you switch off your camera, um, but it, hopefully that will mean that if you've missed any of it or there's been any technical issues, we can send wonderful edited <laughs> technical problem free um, screen uh, streams of the of the presentations later on, and yes, sorry, sorry to, to Margaret really that you had these problems with your own PowerPoint presentation. Um, I've been there in that moment as well, and it's really distracting. It's such a shame because the content of your talk was was so good, um, and the slides are great. And hopefully, we'll, we'll see some of them again later. So, apologies to everyone. It is the it's great to have so many people here that probably wouldn't have happened um, if we'd been in Anstruther together, um, but it does bring with it its own issues. Having said that, we could have had something up on a screen all being in the same room and it might not have worked, so we can't we can't just blame being online for that. So um, hopefully, Meg, all will go well with your screen sharing and slide <laughs> moving along and everything. Um, Meg's, Meg's up the road in Anstruther as well. So, um, Meg's a PhD candidate um, with the University of Edinburgh and you, she's been a friend of the museum for a few years. You've undertaken research here and on our behalf, Meg, and we've developed live music events together in pre-pandemic times and hopefully we'll do that again as things open up a bit more. Um, Meg's going to give an overview of the musical practices of gutters and packers in Scotland's herring industry and that will um, take us up to uh, about, well, well, we'll stop before before three so that they get a chat to, to ask Meg questions as well. So I'll hand over to Meg now if that's okay. Thank you. Great, thanks for the introduction, Jen. Um, let's see, I can just share my screen. Can everybody see the PowerPoint? Great. Okay. Well, um, it's great to be here virtually. Um, and thanks for the introduction, Jen. And Margaret, thank you for that excellent talk. Um, so now that uh, Margaret's given you an overview of kind of the, a lot, especially the economic role and the kind of the history of who were the gutters and where was their place among women in the fishing communities more generally, um, my talk is going to be focusing on one particular aspect of their lives, um, which is the role of music. Um, particularly, we're going to talk today about song and dance in the lives of herring gutters and packers. Um, so I first started researching this um, as like a summer internship at the Fisheries Museum in 2016, because I said to Linda, the curator, I was like, why don't we have more about, you know, music? Like, I heard the gutters saying, like, you should put that in the museum. And she was like, well, maybe if you research it, I will put it in the museum. So that's what got me started on this whole thing. And now I'm doing a PhD on it. So thank you, Linda. <laughs> um, you have so much to answer for. But anyway, so that's the genesis of how I got interested in researching this topic. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So Margaret's already given you an excellent overview, um, more than an overview, of who the herring gutters were. Um, in Gaelic, they were known as Clown Nian and Scotten, which means Literally, it kind of means the um, daughters of the herring, but it's more like the girls of the herring. Um, you also see them called gut and quines, herring lassies. Um, in some parts of England and the Isle of Man, they were called splitters because of instead of gutters. So you'll see a lot of different terms. Um, I've got a map here, very similar to the one Margaret had. This is a map of um, herring stocks um, historically. So you can see got Northern Ireland, Isle of Man, the Hebrides, Northern Isles, and then the east coast of Scotland and England. Um, the period I'm going to be talking about, excuse me, just a little water, is from the mid-19th century um, through to the 1970s. Um, 
Although, as Marta said, a lot of the gutting stopped after World War II. There were some places where it kept going for a few decades. And last summer, um, I was able to do some field work in Shetland, um, thanks to funding from the British Forum for Ethnomusicology. And I was able to speak to some women there who worked as gutters at the very end of the gutting in Shetland, which ended in the early 1970s. Um, because in the late 60s, mechanization was introduced to the gutting, which I'll talk about more later. And as Margaret explained, the women were employed by curers, um, and they were usually in crews of two gutters and a packer, and they often started work around age 14. Um, there are some women who started younger, uh, usually helping their mothers, um, so they weren't independently employed. Um, but so some um, did learn it as girls, so that by the time they actually started as official gutters, they already knew how to do it. Okay, so um, first I'm going to talk about the evidence for singing at the gutting, because it's something that um, not everybody knows about that they did this, but there is actually quite a bit of historical um, evidence for it. Um, so the first quote I have here is from a woman called Christina McKinnon, who was a gutter from Barra in the Hebrides. And she used a very interesting phrase to describe the gutting songs. Um, she called them Oran Lue Nakutug, and that means the walking songs of the gutting. So for those who aren't familiar um, with Gaelic work song tradition, the walking songs are when you have the table and you're walking the tweed. So there's a big group of women like thumping the cloth um, and it's to shrink the cloth. And it's really important that you sing while you do that um, because it coordinates the rhythm of the workers so that the cloth is all shrunk at the same um, like thickness. So it's really interesting um, to use um, the phrase Oran Luai Nakutug, um, because that's showing that for the Gaelic speaking women who worked in the industry, um, singing while gutting the fish was something they connected to singing while other types of work they had done on the farms and the crofts uh, back home. Um, and another quote about the rhythm is uh, from Frances Wilkins. Um, research. She's at the University of Aberdeen, and she has a great book called Singing the Gospel about the role of um, sacred song in fishing communities in Northeast Scotland. And she found, um, she did some interviews, um, and this is from Peter Head. Um, the man said, they got into a rhythm, you see? It would have been pum, 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 with a rhythm, something with a rhythm. You'd hear the singing all around the fish yards. So with these two quotes, we can see that there was an element of uh, the singing helping with the rhythm. Like I said, that's very well known for walking songs. Um, probably the most famous example in English would be sea shanties, um, where the singing helped you coordinate the work. Um, so it does show that there was an element of rhythmic coordination going on. On the other hand, though, um, not all it wasn't like those types of work in the sense that not all women sang while they were getting. Some women would just talk and joke. Other times they were concentrating so hard they didn't say anything. Um, so it wasn't required. You didn't have to sing while gutting, but um, for the women who did, it could help them get into the zone um, because they could gut as many as one fish a second, um, some of the fastest gutters, which is kind of mind boggling to think about. Um, so there are some historical accounts of people talking about hearing the music in the different languages, um, an unnamed English gutter. This is from a Gallic book about the gutting, um, Clownian and Scotton. Uh, says, as you pass through Lower Pultney and Wick, you could hear them singing the lovely Gallic songs as they worked at the herring. So hearing the Gallic was definitely something that non-Gallic speakers would comment on. Um, interestingly, sometimes they would kind of romanticize the Gallic songs, like, oh, they must be singing ancient songs of the homeland. Um, but as I'll talk about later, when you actually look at the lyrics, they're often dirty songs about the fishermen, um, so a little bit different. Um, and then we have a couple quotes um, up here about why the women were singing. And there's different reasons for that, which are worth um, thinking about. So this quote about um, Gutters in Aberdeen in 1893 says, um, you know, when the women were working, it was almost midnight and raining. They said, they were singing cheerfully as they worked. We found out afterwards that singing over their work was a sure sign that it was hard and that they were tired, as then they sing to keep up their spirits. And that's very similar to the quote up here from Mary Bella Finley of White Hills, 
who says, I sometimes think we sang to stop ourselves crying. So this kind of quote is interesting because there can be a stereotype about workers who sing. Um, like, oh, they're so happy with their position in life. This is the kind of things that Victorians would say, like, they accept their um, position on the social ladder um, so well that they um, sing to show how happy they are to be doing this backbreaking labor. And it's like, actually, sometimes it was kind of the opposite. You know, singing could help boost morale when they needed it most through these difficult working conditions. Um, so quotes like that are really important for challenging the idea that women were somehow just content um, with being paid poorly for hard work. Um, and as Margaret alluded to, and as some people have written about, the women were very active in striking for their wages. Um, I think that's something Emer is going to talk about in her talk as well. So, you know, it wasn't that they were just kind of blithe, like ha blissfully accepting their lot in life. Um, this The singing isn't meant to represent that. On the other hand, um, as uh, has been said, you know, the women often reported it as a very happy time, as Jen was saying in her introduction with camaraderie, and they were away from home for the first time, you know, a bunch of teenage girls, basically, um, meeting fishermen from different ports, there was a lot of excitement, and they were making new friends, so sometimes um, they really would just be happy, um, so like one of the women I spoke to in Shetland, Sissy Goodlad, um, she's in her 90s, um, her son, John Goodlad, has written some books about the fishing industry in Shetland that are definitely worth checking out. Um, she told me, um, it couldn't have happened very often, but sometimes we did if we were feeling happy. Um, so sometimes, you know, the singing was a result of just kind of spontaneous happiness shared among the women. Um, so it's a very nuanced thing. And then um, there's also a lot of information available about the dancing um, that the women would partake in when they were in the gutting. So the photo in the background of this slide is of gutters outside um, their temporary accommodations in Shetland around 1900. Um, I have not been able to find the source of this photo, but it was published in an article about Shetland architecture from the 90s. But um, so in Shetland, they would have temporary accommodations put up, um, whereas in some places like Yarmouth or like one of the commenters mentioned, I think in Scarborough, um, people would be, the women would be taken in as lodgers. Um, so it depended on the place, but in the places where they were put up in separate accommodations like these huts, um, they would host dances on the weekend in their huts. Excuse me. Um, so for example, there's a quote here from the Aberdeen Journal in 1915 um, about the effect of World War I, um, you know, uh, on the gutting, there was a quote from a fisherman who said, it will be a queer East Coast without the herring fishing and the girls singing in the gutting sheds. So you can see that that soundscape was something that was missed when, the, when it wasn't happening because it was seen as such an integral part of what was going on. Um, I'm going to play you a little sample of the oldest gutting song I've found. Um, Nan McKinnon from Vattersea contributed an incredible amount of songs to the School Scottish Studies Archive um, in the mid-20th century, and a few of them were Lewis gutting songs that her mother had learned as a gutter in the 1880s. Um, so this one, um, the for those of you who speak Gaelic, um, the phrase to listen for will be a dance of a uh, sorry, Downsave Guhayaroch and Tayan Alex Stephen. Alex Stephen was Alexander Stephen and Sons, who were curers. Um, so that's, um, they were enthusiastically, merrily dancing in the houses of Alex Stephen. So let me just play you a little clip of this. Hopefully, my internet will cooperate. There we go. So this, um, her mother learned in the 1880s. Okay. Uh, we own a thousand, a thousand, a cadet. We own a thousand, a thousand, a cadet. We own a thousand, a thousand, a cadet. Thousand work a higher hand die in a lick, Stephen. O covert my lamb and so to go to Camosa. Quell lot of ruin your eyes, tidy in a lord, and we own a thousand, a thousand, a We own a thousand, a thousand, a cadet. Right. So in that one, she's singing about how they would dance um, in the cures' huts, because um, the cures are the ones who paid to have them 
built. Um, uh, in Shetland, I listened as well to some archival recordings um, that had been done before my time. Um, and one was with a gutter called Lizzie Robertson, um, who talked about how all the furniture was cleared and you would dance. And that's actually where she met her husband, which was a very common story, um, uh, meeting the husbands at the gutting. Um, a woman I interviewed in Shetland called Adeline Fullerton. Um, she's from Burra, and she is part of the Burra Historical Society. And she showed me a huge binder um, full of photographs of couples who got married because they met at the gutting. And those were just the ones where one of them was from Burra. So, I mean, this was a pretty common phenomenon. Um, this was a real important opportunity to meet people from different places. Um, Woman from Bucky, um, talking about kind of the 20th century, says that some huts had a gramophone and there was always somebody who brought along his squeeze box or a mouth organ or a cooper with his fiddle. We had some great time singing and dancing. Um, so that gives you an idea of the kinds of instruments. Um, would have been a lot of like button melodians, which are like little accordions. Um, in Shetland, the fiddle, of course, was very popular. Um, sometimes fishermen were not, they weren't really supposed to bring musical instruments on the boat, um, but there are some interviews in Bucky Heritage Society's archive, which show, say um, that they would smuggle the button melodians on anyway because they wanted to bring them to these dances with the girls on the weekends. Um, and the um, one thing I'll talk about a little bit more later too is that there were actually some Irish men um, who worked as gutters as well, which is uh, not something that there's a lot of awareness about. I was surprised, but a lot of the Shetlanders talked about it in their interviews. Um, you know, in Scotland, it was extremely rare for men to work as gutters. Um, I've only heard of one example um, of a guy from Methyl working as a herring gutter. Um, but Irish men and women would come over from Ireland working for Scottish curing companies. Um, and the Irish men were especially known for their dancing. Um, so like this quote from Ida Johnson says, um, you'll have to excuse my Scots. It's not very good. Um, the Irish boys had a hut to seize across the burn, and they had music of their own, and for such lovely dancers. And oh boy, it was the good dancing. I just loved that. Um, so, you know, the in this case, the Irishmen were particularly known as good dancers. Um, and some people, you know, sometimes the dances would go on well into the night. So Julia O'Donnell, who was an Irish woman who came to work in Shetland, said, you started at eight o'clock, and you would dance until five in the morning. And then as soon as you hit your bed, it was time to wake up to cut the fish. Although they often held them on Saturday nights since there was no fishing on Sunday. So they could sleep in a little bit more. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna talk about different regions um, different lingu linguistic and musical traditions in the gutting. Um, so as I've already mentioned, Gaelic speakers were an important part of the gutting um, workers. Uh, they tended to come especially from Lewis, and a lot of the Gallic gunning songs reference Lewis place names um, in particular, and they would kind of, you know, you could improvise them um, because the songs were often set formulas, of, like love song formulas, but you could switch in the names of different fishermen and different boats and different place, little villages in Lewis where you or your boyfriend was from, and women would often compose these um, improvised versions of the songs to tease each other. Um, most of that context is totally lost in the versions that have been recorded, um, but originally they would have been composed as these very personal ditties. Um, the genre of Gallic song these fall under is por stabil, which um, means music out of, tunes out of the mouth, um, and that's music sung for dancing. So like the song I played for you earlier of Nan McKinnon, that was a Porsche. Um, because, you know, if they didn't have instruments or they just wanted to sing, you would sing to accompany the dancers. And I think um, that's the fastest type of Gallic work song there is. Uh, and so I think it was better suited to the gutting than most walking songs or milking songs or other kinds of work songs were. And also they were singing these dance songs at the weekends too. So I think there was a lot of crossover there. Um, and the songs were often very body and funny and fast paced. Um, and they would mix English and Scots words with Gaelic. You'll see that in a minute with a song I'm gonna show you. Um, one aspect that is worth talking about is that the lyrics of the songs 
in, even though, you know, on the surface, they might seem like just kind of, to quote Paul McCartney, silly love songs. <laughs> um, there's actually a lot of social history information encoded in them. Um, so in the Hebrides, the traditional type of housing was the Taidu or the Black House, which you see in the top picture. And those were mostly one room, um, very traditional to the Hebrides. They're very well suited for people um, who need to be protected from the wind. Um, but the women who worked as gutters, when they traveled, they often sing in their songs about how they preferred the whitewashed two-story houses um, with separate rooms that they saw on the Scottish mainland and in the Northern Isles. Um, so for example, um, in the song from Nan McKinnon that I played for you a few minutes ago, she says, My lover is building me a white house. There's a wooden floor in it and stairs in order. Um, in other songs, the women sing about how the black houses afforded very little privacy. Um, one body gutting song is about how this woman and her boyfriend spend so long trying to figure out where and when they're going to hook up. But finally, when they meet in the black house, um, the, the old lady walks in on them and like the dog runs in and the cat. So there's just not a lot of privacy for couples. Um, and so they sing about how they want these houses with running water and whitewashed um, walls. Which is really interesting because, you know, the decline of the Black House is considered a, quite a loss um, to the vernacular culture of the Hebrides. Um, but it's interesting seeing that the, these women, that was a change they wanted. Um, doesn't mean everybody shared that feeling with them, but I think that's worth pointing out. Um, so now I'm going to play you um, this song from Mary Morrison. She was a gutter from Barra. And I did some research in the School of Scottish, or not School of Scottish Studies, Fisheries Museum archive. Um, and there's some bolts mentioned to this song, which date it to about 1922. Um, so that's when she improvised a lot of the lyrics. Uh, let's just load this here and I'll have the lyrics up so you can look, at, follow along in English and Gaelic.
Great. So um, that one's worth listening to in full. Uh, I, it really tells you a lot about how these songs were. Um, you know, the way she sang it here, um, even though this wasn't recorded while she was gutting, um, the way everybody else joins in on the refrain while she just sings the verses, that's how it would have been at the gutting yards usually. There would have been one lead singer at the Farland and then the rest joining in on the chorus. Um, and you can see she's used um, a lot of English words here like engine room, deckhand, engine trouble, gangway, um, and even a Scots word shoddy, um, which is for like a catch of fish. Um, and then there are the boats mentioned, honeydew and fairweather. And MacIver, um, the one, you know, this one's uh, Honeydew is coming to the bay, privately owned by MacIver. That's not about the boat. That's the catch of the fish. MacIver um, was Duncan MacIver, a uh, um, curer from Stornoway. Um, it was Maggie Smith, um, who's a researcher from Lewis, who told me about that. Um, and there are different versions of this song um, with different boats. And this one, I uh, will leave it to your imagination, but it's considered very dirty. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of innuendo in here. Um, but I better move on to the next uh, category. Okay, so that was Gaelic. Now we're going to talk about songs um, that the Scottish women were singing. Um, so there's quite a bit of variety here, um, but there's less documentation of it compared to the Gaelic. Um, so uh, the first one I have up on the slide here was actually provided by a trustee of the Fisheries Museum, Bill Motion, um, who um, was kind enough to share with me um, after a talk I gave in Anstruther. Uh, it reminded him of a song his mother had sang, sung, and she was a herring gutter from St. Monin's, although um, she moved to Cellardyke when she got married, so that's where he grew up. And she improvised lyrics um, to the tune of the Scottish dance song Bon Accord. Um, so, Div, you see the KY is coming. Um, for those who live locally, you'll know KY is our postcode um, in the East Nuke, but it's also um, the registration uh, code for the boats um, that were registered in Kirkcaldy. So all the local boats here um, were KY. You can tell where a boat um, is from roughly by looking at its registration code. There's a map in the Fisheries Museum where you can press a button on the code and it'll light it up on the map. So if you've never done that, that's fun. Um, but so he says, did you see the KYs coming with Bonnie Jockey Murray on their boot? And Bill Motion told me the story about how um, Jockey Murray was their neighbor. And his mother said, yeah, um, my pal, she was dating Jockey Murray. And so I um, composed these lyrics to tease her. Um, and then they ended up getting married and were their neighbors in Cellardyke. Um, so that, that's an example of the kind of context that most of these recordings are missing. Um, so it was really special that he shared that with me. Um, and you can imagine that all the Gallic ones where they're putting in names like Murahug and Eon, um, there would have been a story behind that too. Um, the next one I want to play you is interesting because um, so Isla Sinclair um, sang a recording of this. Um, her grandmother from Lewis sang this while standing on the key in Stornoway, waiting for the boats to return home. I'm just going to play a little bit. Oh, the fisherman's a bonny, bonny lad. I've never seen anything bolder. He wears his sea beats over his knees and the straps across his shoulders. I'm a rambling, tumbling, father do a day. I'm a rambling, tumbling, lassie. I'm a rambling, tumbling, father do a day. And they call me the fisherman's lassie. So that's some, you know, kind of a slower pace um, when she was singing it while waiting for the boats to come in because the women would often be knitting and singing while they were waiting um, for the herring to land. Um, but her, so that was Isla Sinclair. Her mother, Zeta Sinclair, um, was a gutter. Um, and she gave an interview for the Scots Magazine where she said she sang that song while working, but they really picked up the pace to make it match the rhythm of the work. Um, so that shows that, you know, these things were kind of fluid um, rhythmically. Um, then the Shetland women um, in the interviews in the Shetland archive really said that the Scottish women sang um, what they called the Scotch songs, and that included traditional Scottish songs, but also music hall. Um, it's interesting, um, they say, you know, Harry Lauder. Um, and so it's interesting that from the Shetland perspective, that was kind of considered like a old Scottish song. Um, and there's an example here of a woman called Chrissy Smith from Wick, who was a gutter and a kipperer. 
um, singing a bit of a music hall song. I'm 94 this morning, I am 94 today. I'm not as young as I used to be, I'm getting old and grey. But my heart is young and I'm fond of fun and I'm very proud to see. I may be getting married on Thursday, so I'm 94 today. Oh, the people in the village, they will get a big surprise. Of course, they don't believe me, they think I'm telling lies. But maybe I'll surprise them yet to sure as I'm alive. They might be a Christian yet before a night to die. <laughs> you got to look bad. Um, okay, so that's an example, um, you know, where they're taking music hall songs and singing them. And she says that one's funny because she was singing it when she was 20. And she couldn't imagine being 95. But when she was doing this recording, she was in her 80s. Um, so it really gives you a sense of the kind of youthful fun that was going on here. I just wanted to say a quick word about the Isle of Man. Um, I'm going there in July to give a talk and do some research because in the Isle of Man was also part of the Herring Rue. And there's a little bit of information about possible Manx songs um, from a woman called Mona Douglas, who, if you know anything about the Isle of Man's history, she was a huge figure in the kind of Celtic revival, the Manx revival there, especially to do with dance. So she's an extremely important figure in Manx history, but she's also a little controversial um, because basically she kind of made stuff up sometimes. And so there's a lot of debate. Um, you know, people tend to think the stuff she wrote earlier in her life was more accurate. And the later in her life she was when she told the story, the more romanticized. So there's a lot of controversy there. So I'm hoping to get some insights from people on the Isle of Man on that when I go. But she says that... Um, you know, when she was a girl, so like in the early, early 20th century, um, women would sing when they salted down the herrings for the winter, um, and, which was like a more of a domestic activity than a commercial activity. Um, and she says, as they worked, they sang. They made little rhymes in the Manx about somebody making fun of somebody. And what's interesting is that on the one hand, in the period she's writing about, the idea of a bunch of young women speaking Manx fluently is very unlikely. On the other hand, if they were older women, you know, it's not specified here, there were some older Manx speakers um, still around in the early 20th century. And the song she gives as an example, um, there are two songs she gives as an example, Shen Ven and Juan Ejagged Kier. Um, and they're both real Manx songs um, that people would improvise names about. Shen Ven is kind of like, I'm 94 this morning. It's about a woman who's 60 when she gets married and has no idea what to do with her husband. Um, so it's possible. Um, I want to look into that more. And she also gives an example of a song called The Sea Invocation in Manx, which is, um, she says it was one Fisher Girls would sing while they were waiting for the boats to come in. Um, and she gives a Manx text for it, but the refrain is really like a Gaelic walking song, um, which Manx songs don't normally have that kind of refrain. So it's a bit of a mess, but if you're interested in the Isle of Man part, um, that's that, and I'll be doing some more research about that. Um, another type of music, which was commonly sung by gutters, especially in the Northeast and Northern Isles, were hymns. Um, like I said, Frances Wilkins has done a lot of research on this. And she found that there were basically two big evangelical revivals in fishing communities um, that led to this. There was one in the 1890s, and then there was one in 1921, which was a really bad year for the fishing. Um, and it coincided with like this preaching tour. And so the Moody and Sankey songbooks, Sacred Songs and Solos, became hugely popular. I mean, there are newspaper articles about people just like collapsing from singing hymns in the street. Um, the fishermen would sing when they went out on the boats and when they came back in. And so it's not surprising that the women who worked as herring gutters were also, they started singing hymns because it was this sort of evangelical fervor of like, um, you know, we have to glorify God in everything we do, which is very different than the Gallic women. You know, Lewis is, has a reputation as quite a religious island, um, but they have the Gallic Psalms singing. Uh, not hymns, and it would have been considered quite inappropriate to sing that while doing like this kind of dirty gutting work. Um, but that's not the attitude that the women in the Northeast had. And what you find is they particularly liked hymns that they could relate to their lives. So, I will make you fishers of men, deep and wide throughout the lifeline. Will your anchor hold? You know, these kinds of nautical hymns. Um, there's a quote from the Yarmouth Mercury here, in that year, 1921, 
Um, some girls, while well, some girls sang as they toiled favorite Scotch songs, in one yard they blended their voices and hymns. Um, so that shows you that, the, you know, it wasn't everybody in the yard singing the same song. Each Farlin would have its own thing going on, and sometimes Farlins would join up together, but other times they'd have their own um, thing going on. And then after that had been going on for a while, you know, some people, hymns were just what they knew. It wasn't so much about belief, but just this is what we know. Um, so Jeannie Innes from Bucky says, they can't ah the hymns, they didn't can say mickle either songs. So, you know, it was just kind of singing what you knew. Um, and then Adeline Fullerton, who I spoke to, um, she started getting in the mid to late 60s. And by that point, she said they were definitely not singing hymns. Um, so they had fallen out of fashion. Like I mentioned, another interesting element here is the Irish one, um, which I'm still looking into, um, but there was a lot of material about that in Shetland. Um, uh, one woman I spoke to, Rita McNabb, um, who's in her 80s, um, she started getting around 1950, and she said her first year working at the English fishing, she was a packer for two Irish male gutters. Um, she said they could go very fast. <laughs> And, um, and, you know, the men would also help lifting the barrels and stuff. I mean, sometimes the women did that themselves, but um, there were these male workers working with them, too. Um, and different women in Shetland talk about different music that the Irish men introduced to them um, or that was particularly popular with them. Um, so Nellie Christie said they liked um, the Boys of Blue Hill. Um, again, they were very well known for the dancing. Um, Adeline Fullerton told me um, in the late 60s that some of the Irish workers sang Irish rebel songs. Um, so obviously, this is kind of, you know, in the period of the Troubles. So she said that she didn't realize at the time how kind of politically controversial some of the songs they were singing were only later. Um, uh, she had an interesting story. Um, her future sister-in-law, um, the Fullerton family, there was like a family legend that they came from a part of Ireland. Um, and for reasons I can't quite remember, um, Adeline tells it better. There were, there was a taboo in their family about the song Danny Boy. Um, so if they were sitting in the huts and the Irish boys started trying to sing Danny Boy, she would just be like, get out, like you can't sing that in here. Um, or as Rita said that Danny Boy was one of um, the favorites that she would sing while she was a gutter, um, as well as another Irish hymn, the old, old Rugged Cross. Um, so this really shows the, um, influence of Irish workers and their repertoire on the Scottish women. And then the final category of music, um, which was popular, it's kind of a big category, country, western, and pop. So like commercially made um, music. You already saw this a little in the earlier period with the music hall, um, but what happens by the 50s is that um, country and western took Shetland by storm. Everybody I talked to in Shetland tell me how big country and western was and still is. Um, so, um, like Sissy Goodlad told me that they would sing Hank Williams songs, um, they loved singing Mockingbird Hill, which several different artists from the 50s did versions of, um, Adeline talked about listening to country and western, um, even, um, folk revival made it in. Rita told me that, um, they would sing Ewan McCall's The Shoals of Herring while they were filling up the barrels, um, which is very interesting because that's a folk revival song, you know, Ewan McCall was not herring gutter he wrote that song kind of as the industry was dying out and it's i think it's relatable to a lot of people who worked in the industry as you can see which is interesting because you know folk revival songs sometimes are quite romanticizing the work and that sort of thing but rita said they would sing that while they were filling up the barrels and then in the 60s they introduced the gutting machine um which i'll talk about in a minute um, so the women weren't working while, or singing while working, but they would still buy um, records. There was a record shop in Lairwick where they would spend a lot of their earnings. Um, and then they said, you know, by the end of the year, their records were totally worn out because they would just listen to them over and over again in their huts. And one of them um, told me about how they would plug in, because the only electricity in the hut was the light hanging from the ceiling. So they would kind of rig the um, record player up to that so they could listen to the records and they would dance on the weekends. Um, so like Adeline talked about one year, there were some Norwegian fishermen visiting and they were obsessed with um, the equals, baby come back. And so every time she hears that song, um, she thinks of them. And at that point they were listening to like the Beatles, Rolling Stones, Herman's Hermits. Um, Adeline even met Paul McCartney in Lerwick um, when she, uh, there was a day when 
the herring boats were so late coming in that she and her friend just kind of went to have a wander around the town and Paul and Linda were there on holiday. Um, and so, and she went back to the gutting huts, um, like, oh my God, we met Paul McCartney and nobody believed them. <laughs> so they all, all the herring girls, um, since the boats had a comedian, ran around town looking for Paul McCartney. Um, so that gives you a sense of just kind of the continuity, even across really different genres. Um, in that kind of interest in whatever music was popular. Um, so this photo, Linda of the Fisheries Museum took for me recently. Thank you, Linda. Um, it's a prototype of a gutting machine that was used in Shetland. I'm not sure if the real machines were actually a bit bigger. Um, I haven't yet seen a good photo of the women working at the machines, but the women at the machines would work in crews of six or seven. Um, it was a different process and it was partially indoors, partially outdoors. It wasn't factory yet. Um, but the machine was too loud to sing over. Um, one woman I spoke to who asked not to have her name given said, you could maybe whistle over the machine, but you really couldn't sing. Um, and people would contrast that negatively with the singing that had been in the gutting yards before. So this Cooper from Shetland quoted here, he said, um, the machine was harder. When you're outside on a lovely day, the Farlands was full of herring and the birds singing. And usually the lasses, a lot of them were singing too. Um, and Rita said, you know, you couldn't, everybody said it was going to be the best thing since sliced bread, um, but she doesn't think that because it finished the gutting. Um, and by that, you know, obviously fish are still processed, but by that she means like the kind of social economic phenomenon around the herring girls. Um, she says the machine never stopped for a cup of tea. There was more work to it than just saying, oh, it's quicker. But I always said quicker for who? Um, so among women who had worked at the hand gutting, like Rita or um, this Cooper, um, James Mace Manson, who had been working in the yards before the machine, there was a lot of negativity about how the machine had affected um, the social scene. Um, but the women who worked only on the machines, like Adeline, you know, they hadn't worked in the yards before, so they didn't have that same kind of negativity about it, even though they did say it was too noisy to sing over. And those women you know, they were the ones listening to this type of music. Um, so they continued having dances in the huts and music was still a really important part of their lives, even while the mechanization meant they couldn't still sing while working. Um, so just a few conclusions. Um, the Gutting Yard was a multilingual musical in um, social and working environment. You would have had women from different languages. There's even a quote from a gutter from White Hills saying um, when she worked alongside the Gallic gutter, she says, Pretty soon they had a singing in their language, um, which I don't think they were le actually learning Gaelic. I think they were joining in on the nonsense refrains. Um, and that's part of, uh, I didn't get into it too much, but that's, they sound less Gaelic than they normally would. I think you would have had women who didn't speak Gaelic singing these nonsense words alongside Gaelic gutters um, because they had their own nonsense syllables in Scots. Um, so anyways, there was a lot of musical and linguistic exchange. Um, no matter what language they were singing in, there was often a lot of similarities um, in what they were I'm unmuted, okay, <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, the main exception was that the Gallic speaking women did not sing religious music while they were gutting. Um, that they would have considered that inappropriate. Um, uh, and young women basically sang whatever songs were popular at the time, whether that was traditional Gallic dance songs or music hall or hymns or the Beatles. Um, basically, you know, it shows that there was no kind of sense of, oh, there are work songs and those are the only ones we sing. Like we, no, they just were singing whatever they wanted to sing. If they could make it work with the gutting, they were gonna do that. And the gutting machine led to the end of singing while working, but singing and dancing in the huts persisted until um, the changeover um, completely to factory gutting later in the 20th century. Um, okay, so that's the end of my presentation. Hopefully I haven't gone too far over. Oh, it's 43, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll take any questions then. Thanks so much for that, Meg. That was an amazing talk. Um, there's been loads of discussions and questions in the chat, but um, would anybody like to uh, raise their hand and say something first? Catherine? 
Kathy, we did have a question or comment from Mark um, saying that singing has a familiar rhythm to sea shanty songs sung by mariners. And we've had an event before where Jan B. Brown, who's here today, um, said a little bit about um, the sea shanties that she's researched and said that she'd be willing to say a little bit now about that. If, if you're there, Jan. I am, yep. <laughs> if you can see me. Brilliant. Hi. Thank you, Meg. That was absolutely fantastic. And yeah, I mean, obviously, it's the shanty man who had the best bunk and the, the extra bottle of rum uh, who led, you know, just like the, the, the lead gutter or the older gutter led the, led the singing. And then there would be a refrain. I'm doing a lot of singing with a dementia friendly shanty choir at the moment called the Shalda Shanty Crew here in Shetland. And uh, that, that, that easy sort of call and response. Uh, is absolutely ideal if you're working. I mean, obviously a sea shanty is there as opposed to a sea song to get a job done To And there are different types of songs for different jobs on the boat, whether you're pulling up the anchor or whether you're actually pulling up the sails. And the emphasis on haul away, Joe, is the Joe is the pull, you know, so that was the hero. So uh, I expect, I'm really looking forward to actually looking into some of these songs now. Thanks, Meg. Uh, and uh, just to, to sort of kind of see how that would work. But I'm really fascinated about the, the stuff from the 50s and the 60s now. That's brilliant. So I'll listen to that and, and can just imagine. Someone was just chatting to me earlier about the fact that you didn't only have the songs uh, in terms of noise, but you would have the screech of the of the gulls. Mm -hmm. because, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, the gulls were flying in the air, and the and the seabirds were, were sort of coming down. So you can imagine that cacophony of sound must have been amazing. Well, as in loud and extraordinary to hear. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point, and that's like um this quote, this guy, the Cooper, who says um you know when the gutting machines come in, you don't hear the birds or the women anymore. And so there's that kind of link, although, um, you know, calling gulls singing might be a stretch, but, <laughs> but yeah, that was really, and that's really good how you brought up about how the shanty songs are for like different tasks. And from what I can tell, the gutting songs were never quite so like regimented and specialized in that sense, which is an interesting difference. Um, although like Rita would say, you know, we'd sing this song, we'd be more likely to sing this song when we were filling up. Um, so there is a little bit of that, but, um, and I think another thing that's interesting is that, you know, shanties are infamous for being so bawdy and people can sometimes think women didn't sing those kinds of songs, but when you look at the getting songs, it's like they did. <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks for sharing your thoughts about that, Jan. That was really interesting. My pleasure. Sylvia, I think you had a couple of questions, um, but you typed, but they may have been answered, but if not, do you want to ask them again? Ask them in person. You asked what time period were the country and western songs sung by the Herring Gutters? So that would have been, um, especially in the 50s. Um, so, and some of those would have actually been sung while they were working, like Sissy Goodlad telling me that, um, Mockingbird Hill was one that she could really remember singing while actually doing the gutting. Um, whereas like when Adeline says we listen to country and Western, that was just in the huts because that was in the sixties. I mean, I'm told country and Western is still very popular in Shetland. So I think basically from the fifties, maybe the late forties onward, that music became pretty popular. And Shetland was the place where the gutting went on the longest. Um, so I think that's why you see it there. Uh, we've also got a question from Rona. Uh, were the dances that were, were there any dances that were particularly known to the fishing girls? Oh, that's a good question. That's something I have to look into more because I'm not as familiar um, with, you know, the, the history of different dances. I think um, uh, there would have been kind of Kaylee style dancing. Um, there's a quote from some guy in Shetland who says like, oh, the Gallic girls, they would have the Highland fling in the huts. So it's like, not entirely sure what he meant by that. But you can imagine some sort of like um, traditional dancing. One thing I didn't mention, um, but which is important is that in Shetland, there was an end of season dance called the foy. Um, 
And so everybody who worked in the industry would be invited to a huge dance in one of the cooperage um, sheds, which they would clear out. So there was room for like tons of people and they would do Scottish country dancing there. And then Adeline told me um, in the 60s when they were, um, I wish I could have gotten this on video or imitation of their dance. I was like, so what kind of dancing would you be doing when listening to the records? And she's just like this, like, she's like, you know, just kind of shake. So kind of more modern, less regimented dancing. So I think there would have been a variety, but some of them in Shetland talk about how um, the soldiers stationed there um, in the war would teach a lot of the new kind of dances, like the foxtrot and that sort of thing. Um, so that's one thing I'd like to look into more, you know, like when they would go to places like Yarmouth and they weren't having dances in the huts, they were going to like dance halls. You know, I want to look into more like what kinds of dances were they doing? But So that's a really good question. Um, that's all I have about that for now. I think it was Celia that asked as well about any songs that we would know now, but it's also interesting to hear from Matt that some of the songs that you play today, um, that chorus and um, audiences still join in with the choruses if they're played at, at um, Kayleigh's in the Hebrides. Yeah, that's true. And um, there's a book, um, Songs of Gaelic Scotland by Anne Lorne Gillies. And she's got a version in it of this song that Mary Morrison did, but the verses are very different. There are a couple verses that are always in it, like um, usually the one about um, there's a strait between me and my love. It's usually the strait between Bernera and Ewick. Um, but th the version that um, Anne Lorne Gillies has, she says that um, she's heard it done in Kayleigh's in Glasgow, where it's about a police officer <laughs> instead of a fisherman. So there is the, some of these songs are still alive um, in the kind of world of being improvised um, for dances. Now, it's 10 to 3, and I, I, and I think everyone would probably like to go and grab a biscuit or something. <laughs> Um, we, we do have lots of really, you know, more, more comments. Um, we will be sharing, we will be sharing the PowerPoints and the talks, and um, again, someone's asked, so you can go back and when we share them, it won't be immediately after today, today's event, but in the next couple of weeks, you'll be able to go back and maybe find links and just clarify things that you have misremembered or not quite sure what, what people said. And our speakers have kindly agreed to share their email addresses as well. Um, we've had lots of people, there's obviously very knowledgeable people in our audience who are sharing information with each other. So I would urge you while you have a drink or something to just have a look through the chat. Um, Davine's been contributing. Um, this, is, this is kind of what we want people to, to share share knowledge that they have themselves and perhaps we'll sort of go over some of it in the last half hour after Emer's talk. Um, so we'll just stop for a, a break now and reconvene in about seven minutes time. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing Emer's, Emer's presentation. But Meg, I think everybody agrees that you're, you know, you've done such amazing research, you've really got out there and met people and, and come out with wonderful detail about, about the lives through song. And I think the songs, when you hear it, it just brings, it brings the people in the photographs and in our memories to life and tells us a lot about these communities. So thank you very much. Thank um, you. Yeah. And um, just before we break, I asked, I saw somebody asked, will you be sharing all the PowerPoints with the references? And um, if anybody, I have all my references written down. Um, I didn't give all the citations in the PowerPoint. So if there's one you want to know, I have it written down and I can tell you. So like Jen said, you know, our, we'll, you'll all be getting our emails. So if there's some reference and you're like, oh, she didn't put a citation on the PowerPoint. Don't worry, I have one and you can email me. We can talk about it. <laughs> Great. Thank, thank you everyone. See you in five minutes or so.